Good afternoon and welcome to Photo Joseph's live training series start number 1900. This is the 19th series we're doing. This is episode 1900. As you may well know, but if not, I'm going to tell you how this whole thing works. The 00 episode, the 1900 in this case, is an overview session. This is an overview of the new app that we're about to explore, which in this case, of course, is Filmic Pro. We are looking at this on iOS. We're looking at it on the iPhone 10 specifically. However, this works on your iPad. It works on many Android phones as well, and we're going to talk a little bit about that um, when we get started here. So the way that these overview sessions work is this is not, this session right now you're watching is not meant to be an all-encompassing training. That would be very, very long. This is a high-level overview. This is to give you enough information about the app that we're exploring to help you to decide whether you want to learn more about it. Even if you're already a user, you might pick up a couple of tips today. But if you're already a Filmic Pro user, odds are you're going to know everything we're going to hit today. You're going to want to tune into the later sessions. So the later sessions are where we will deep dive into specific aspects, features, components, add-ons, etc for the app. And we will do that once a week during the live training session, which is almost always on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific, as it is right now. Uh, I've got some travel coming up, so those time schedules may change, so just keep an eye on the YouTube channel. Also, if you go to photojoseph.com slash events, you will see a calendar on there of all upcoming shows, and you'll be able to see exactly when they're coming. And I usually have them planned out a week or two in advance, so you'll know exactly when those are going to be. So this show, the overview, is free to watch live, as all shows are free to watch live. And this one, however, will remain free indefinitely. So if you miss any part of this one today, you can watch it anytime on YouTube for free. The main training session, starting with 1901 and onwards, will be free while live, but then we'll go behind the paywall at photojoseph.com. There's a members page on there, a membership uh, component to that. If you pay either a monthly or an annual fee, you have access to not only this training, but all previous live training sessions. So that's how that works. So if you want to know more about that, photojoseph.com slash members. If you just want to, if you're already a member, you want to dive in, just go to photojoseph.com and you'll see these videos right on top. So with that said, Let's get into it. So what is Filmic Pro? Well, Filmic Pro is a video camera, a video software, video app for your smartphone or tablet. This is allowing you to do an incredible amount of control, allowing you to have an unbelievable amount of control over the camera that's built into these devices over what you already have built in. So, you know, you've got, if you're shooting iOS, you obviously have a camera app and there are I probably hundreds, if not thousands, of different camera apps on the App Store. Same on Google. You've got, uh, for Android, on the Google Play Store, you've got tons and tons and tons of different camera apps on there. Some of them basically replicating the built-in features, and some of them giving you a lot more features. Some of them are simply tapping into capabilities that the camera already has, that the oper it's already built into the operating system, but they just don't really, Apple in this case, doesn't really use it. But um, a lot of these are some very creative decisions that they've made on their own, engineering they've done on their own, to take in the data that's coming from these camera sensors and doing even more with it than, frankly, I think probably anyone even at Apple thought possible. It's pretty impressive what you can do in here. So if you're just shooting family video, normal, like you're just going to grab your phone and go out and take some video, this isn't for you. Right? If you're going to do that, just, just use the built-in camera app. It's fine. It does what you need. This is if you want to take complete and total control. And that doesn't just mean overexposure and focus, but things like your gamma curve, your white balance, and an incredible other array of things that you can control with this. So this is really a high-end user's feature, a pro user's feature. I know plenty of professionals who will use Filmic Pro on their device as a fill-in for when they're using their bigger cameras, whether they're shooting a Lumix or Sony or Canon or whatever. You need an extra shot in there. You need another camera. You can do some pretty cool things in here, and I would say, uh, for some types of shots, obviously not for everything, but for some types of shots, you can, with a little bit of work, you can get a shot on here that you can slip in with your footage from another bigger camera, and no one will be the wiser. So it's uh, it's pretty impressive what you can do. So with that all said, we're going to dive into a little overview here. For those of you who are watching live, if you have any questions during the live show, put them into the live chat. Do type at photo Joseph in front of it. That way it shows up in red on my screen, and I know that you've got a question for me. Like I think we have some example. Nobody's done that yet, but it'll show up live on, uh, showed up in red on my screen. So I will know that you've got a question to ask, and I'll do my best to answer it. And of course, if you aren't watching live and you have any questions, pop them into the comments later on, and uh, I'll do what I can to address those for you. Especially if you see something that you want to see more information about, or you have a question about what you've seen today, you want me to cover that in another show. I will do my best again to do that. So uh, here's the setup today. I'm using an iPhone 10. This is the original iPhone 10, not the new 10s or 10s plus, the original iPhone 10. It is a wider screen than your iPhones that predate this, right? So this is wider than 16 by 9. So if you are already using Filmic Pro, 
on an older iOS device, you are going to see some interface differences in here. And I'll point those out to you. There are some advantages of having the extra wide screen and some things that the Filmic folks have done to take advantage of that. Um, I am tethered in via HDMI, so you are going to see through my phone like this. You're going to see exactly what my phone sees. Unfortunately, that means you don't see my fingers. So I will do my best to tell you where I'm touching. If I say over in the lower right, make sure lower right, make sure you take a look in the lower right of the screen because that's where the action is going to happen. I've actually asked the team, the company, to add the ability to show touches on screen because that's really, really great for training. So hopefully we're going to see that at some point. But for now, you just have to kind of follow along. And, and again, I will direct you as much as I can. But when I tell you to look in a specific area, make sure you look in there so you know what's going on. Oh, Mr. Sean Mark Nipper, look at you. Coming up here to wish me a happy birthday. Why, thank you, sir. It is my birthday today. And this is a great birthday present. Having a whole bunch of you here watching live. We have 25 people in the live room right now watching. I appreciate that very much. Uh, anyway, so we're on the HDMI here. This is pointing, I'm going to give you a top-down view. So I've got my camera, the iPhone here. I'm pointing it at a color chip chart on a black cloth so that I can do things like um, when I'm working with the colors in here, I'm going to do some color manipulation. You'll see what's happening on here. Also, uh, as I refocus on different distance objects and readjust the exposure, you're going to see some of that clearly in there. And then there are cases I'm just going to take it away just to make it easier to see what we're looking at on screen. I, I may or may not do that. Anyway, so that's my setup that I've got right here. So that's what we're doing. Let's follow along. SRO Digital, thank you for the happy birthday wish. OK, let's start off with the most basic of basics, exposure and focus, because this is something that well, it's one of the reasons you're going to buy an app like this is because you want to control focus and exposure. So when we look at the screen here, you'll see that there's two boxes that you can control. There's this, get that back, there we go. There's this little square, and let me tap that off. I'll explain the red and white in a moment. There's this little square on here and this little circle. The little square is focus. Wherever this is pointing is where the camera is going to focus. So if I point it on the back there, or if I move this even farther back, let's kind of make a real se separation on here. There we can see it's focused on there. It's trying to at least a little bit blown out. There we go. Um, and then if I move that over to here, it's going to focus on there. So that is your focus control position. So that allows you to say, I'm pointing the frame here, but I want it to focus on the person, the tree, the object, the thing that's there. That's focus. That's the square box. The circle is exposure. And this one, you'll really see a difference here. So right now, I'm pointing at the grid here at kind of a mid-tone area of the grid. If I point it down to the shadows in there, you're going to see it's going to expose for that. And just remember that any meter, any camera meter, is always trying to turn the world into 18% gray, middle gray. So when I point it at black, it's going to overexpose the scene because it's trying to take those blacks and lift them up to middle gray. If I take that and point it at something white, it's going to underexpose the scene because it's trying to make that middle gray. So if I wanted to do a really, really accurate exposure, I could actually go in here with a gray card, with a neutral card, and position the, oh, those are called reticules, position the exposure reticule on that gray card, and then lock it in, lock the exposure in. And the way that you do that, so you see I'm moving it around here. Let's just say that I've determined that's the right exposure. If I tap that circle again, it turns red. And now it doesn't matter where I position it. it positioning is now totally irrelevant. The red is telling me that it has locked. If I position this over here, again, it's red. It is locked. As soon as I tap it, the red's going to go away. And it re-exposes for that area, which, well, there you go. It's already set to that. But it re-exposes for whatever it's on. So as I move this around, we see the exposure change. If I tap it to lock it in, it doesn't. It, it is now not changing no matter where I put it. Same thing with focus. So you've got your focus position here. I can tap that to lock it. It's so now my focus is locked in that position. Not this position. It's not what we're talking about where this is. We're talking about the actual camera focus, where it has focused, the distance that it's focused to, what it has exposed on. That is locked in. So your exposure and focus positions are locked. Now, there's a thing on here where if you are fairly new to the app, you may not have discovered this yet. I've got this little focus area. And I've got this little exposure area. And that's awesome, right? You have great power. But sometimes you're just going, I just, I just want it to focus on what it thinks it should focus on. And I just want a general exposure. Just give me a good, just like when I'm using the built-in camera app. But it seems like you can't do that. But you can. It's like a little bit of a trick, but you can do it. So I'm going to unlock both of these. I'm going to double tap on the focus one first. And you notice how it just got bigger. It's a, not hugely bigger, but it's a little bit bigger on there. And it's red, so it is still locked on there. I'm going to tap it again to make it white. So now anything that's in that larger central area, so basically wherever I point the camera to, is going to be in focus. The exposure one does the same thing, but it gets even bigger. So there's my exposure circle. I'm going to double tap on that. It opens up to a much bigger area. And if I get these out of the way now, you can see those reticules a little bit more cleanly. 
So let's take it off of auto, uh, take it off of lock. So now it's white, so it's in auto position. And so now you've got an exposure meter that is looking at the majority of the scene and a focus meter that is focused on a larger but central area of the scene. So when you are shooting, if you just want it to be easy, if you will, you don't want to have to set your focus and aperture positions, you just put them on that general and let it go. And it's going to basically be just like using the built-in camera. So that's a really important thing on there. You know, I just realized there's something else that I wanted to get into before I started the actual lessons here um, that I totally forgot. So this is about specs on the, the hardware requirements to operate this software. So you're seeing this on an iPhone 10, which is obviously pretty new, pretty high-end hardware. There, everything that you're seeing here, everything I'll show you today, will work on an iPhone 6S and above. You go below a 6S, and there are certain features that will not work, and it just kind of, they drop off as you get into older and older hardware. Now, 6S is not that new. I mean, it's been around for quite a few years now. So I think the majority of users probably are on a 6S or above, but if you are looking at this app and you don't have a 6S, be aware that there will be some limitations in what you can do. I would suggest if you look in the App Store, it might explain it there, or go to their website, and you'll see exactly what will and won't work. On Android, it's a little bit harder. On Android, there are so many different variations of hardware that it's impossible to say this device will work and so on. So what the Filmic folks have done is they've actually created an app that you can download that will tell you exactly what your device, what your Android device is capable of. So the app is called a Filmic Evaluator. So when you go to the Google Play Store, search for Filmic Evaluator. If you don't see it, if you don't find it, that means your device can't run it at all. So, sorry. Assuming you see the app, that means that that app, that downloader, is, uh, that evaluator is compatible with your phone, which means that to some degree, Filmic Pro will be compatible with your phone. You'll download that free app, you run the evaluator, it tests everything in your phone, and it'll tell you what it can and cannot do. So then you can make your decision whether you want to buy the app or not. So super important to know. So you've got that. Um, let's see here. There is a, when you are going through the app in the settings, you're going to find a quick start guide, which is great. And you're going to see a reference to the full user manual, which is a little bit harder to find. It's not actually linked from in here. The reason for that, uh, the Filmic guys explained this to me, is they support quite a few languages for the app, but they can't support that many languages localizing the full manual. So the full manual is in English. If you're not a native English speaker, hopefully you understand it enough that you can dig into it. But if you go to their uh, support site, you'll find a link to that. And we will put a link to that down below in the description here so you know exactly where to go to get the full manual. So that's a huge PDF that tells you basically everything. Uh, there's that. And then, ah, yes, the last thing was, Oh, no, two more things. Uh, there is a Facebook group that is not run by Filmic, but it is called, or if you search on Facebook for Filmic Pro users, you're going to find a Facebook group that is apparently very active. I haven't even gotten involved with it yet, but the Filmic guys told me that they are actually active in that group. So it's not officially a Filmic group, but they are in there. So if you're looking for community support where Filmic is involved, go check that out. So again, that was Filmic Pro users, and I'll find it. I'll put a link down below as well for that Facebook group. And the last thing, and this is something that the Filmic guys asked that I convey to you, the audience, is to express how dedicated they are to customer support. Now, my experience with them is direct as a trainer, so I don't, um, I haven't experienced this from the customer support perspective. But what they explained to me is that their QA team, that's their quality assurance, their testing team, is also their tech support team. So when you reach out to them via tech support and someone's responding to you and trying to help you, these are the same people who are doing all the testing on the app, which means they know it really, really well. I don't know about you, but I've done countless tech support runs with companies where someone's on tech support and they go, well, I don't know. Or, yeah, on tech support, they go, I don't know. Let me talk to an engineer or to a QA person and figure it out. And it takes days and so on. In this case, they're one and the same. So ideally, it makes your support experience better. And they said that they are proud to say they have very, very good support. So there's that. All right, I meant to do all that beforehand. Now let's get back into the app. So we talked about the focus and the uh, exposure reticules and where you can position those. But of course, what you really want to do is be able to take manual control of this. So let's get back into the app. In the bottom left corner, you're going to see three different things. There's the little red, green, blue circles. We're going to come back to that. Next to that, you see a circle with some weird lines around it, and then next to that, an A, so we're in the bottom left corner. I'm going to tap on the middle one, the circle with the lines around it. This opens up the manual controls. Let me get this out of the way again so you can kind of see the controls a little bit more easily. This is a really, really cool interface, allowing you to adjust exposure with your left hand and focus with your right, or zoom, with your right hand, and just with your thumb, moving them in a natural, as you, know, you can obviously see, in a natural arc-like movement. So what happens is, on the left, 
I, if I want to adjust exposure, I just simply drag down or up to change the exposure. So now that I'm in this mode, now that I've activated this by toggling this little mode on or off, now that it's on, I am in manual exposure mode. On the right hand side, we have the same thing with focus. On the right hand side, I slide that up or down, and it's going to change the focus point on there. So let's, let's put something up nice and close. You see we focus on there, focus to the background. On the right there, you see where it says focus. Just underneath that, it says zoom. If I tap on that, it switches over to zoom. And now I can zoom in. This device, uh, this software, will take advantage of your secondary lens in the camera if you have that. Um, I actually don't know. I just realized I don't know the answer to this, if it will automatically switch over while zooming. You can manually tell it to use the other lens. I would assume it's not going to manually switch over while, while zooming, because that would cause a jump in the video as it switched. Um, so I'm going to assume that it doesn't. If I learn otherwise, I'll tell you. But you do have that ability to zoom in. You know, digital zoom is never ideal. It's not optical zoom. Clearly, you're limited to the hardware that's in here. Uh, but um, you know, it works if you need it. You can punch in that way. So that's, there's that. Also, if you're shooting at a lower res, like if you're shooting at HD, not full 4K, you can probably get away with zooming a bit more, and it'll still look OK. Anyway, so back to it. So you've got, again, on the left-hand side, your exposure. On the right-hand side, your zoom, or I'll switch it back to focus. Now, I'm not going to get into it today, but I do want to explain to you what these little lines are. So you see, look at the exposure slider. I'm moving that up and down. There's a center line, and then there's two lines on the outside of it. Those are for doing exposure pulls, and the ones on the right are for doing focus pulls. And we'll get into how to do this in a future session, but what I want you to understand is that you can define two exposure points or two focus points. And then you can have the software automatically ramp between those two points. You can even speed ramp it. So you can have it start slow and then make it go faster. So you can do very fast exposure changes or very accurate exposure changes and very, very cool and creative focus pulls. That's kind of cool. The ability to do that to focus from A to B and start off slow and then ramp up fast. And it's all something that you can do in here. So those are those outside lines are. That's the defining point of those focus points or exposure points. Again, we'll show how to do that in a future session. But I just wanted you to see that that was there. OK, so there's, there's that. There's my exposure. And there's my focus. If I want to go back to auto, I just turn this off, tap on that little button in the bottom left, the circle with the dots, uh, the lines around it. And it returns back to auto. And let's just unlock these so we're in full auto mode again. To the right of that, you have the A. And the A opens up a little drawer at the very top there. It's called the analytics tray. So I know it's, it's called a tray. It's not really, there's not a tray, but there's four icons at the top on there. And these do four different things, obviously. You have zebra striping, you have clipping, you have false color, and you have focus beaking. So let's take a look at these all individually. Let me put this back in here. And right away, you see something a little bit odd. You'll see that the image is now black and white. Let me Turn that off, it goes back to color. Turn on the zebra striping, it goes to black and white. OK, well, why is that? Well, it's black and white so that you can focus on what we're trying to evaluate here, the exposure. In focus peaking, same thing. It goes to black and white because it's there. It's really just removing all the extraneous information. Just look at the exposure. Just look at the focus. However, you can make it show up in color. And I'm going to show you that in a moment. But the default position, the way it just kind of normally works, or the way it does work when you tap on those icons, is the image goes black and white. So what are all these things? Well, if you're unfamiliar with them, let's just quickly go through them. This is showing me whether what is over and underexposed. So the red stripes are overexposed. The blue stripes are underexposed. This clipping is showing me the exact same information. It's just showing it in a different way. It's solid red where it's over, uh, solid blue where it's under. This is this false color is for exposure as well. Anything that is green is accurately exposed. As it gets towards red or blue, it is under or overexposed. And then finally, we have focus peaking. So with focus peaking turned on, you can see what is and isn't in focus. You can see that the foreground stuff. Let me uh, let me see. Let me get out of this mode and go into full uh, full automatic by positioning. So there, I am auto. I am focused on the color chips in the foreground. The thing in the background, the remote control there, is kind of in focus, but not really. If I move this over to here, and it just seemed to be having a hard time focusing on that. There we go. You see a little bit better. We're getting a little bit more clarity on what's focused on the background there. It's still, it's just, I don't know why this doesn't really want to focus that well in there. Let's try that. Let me tilt that. There we go. That's gone a little bit better there. So you see the focus peaking in there. OK, so that's great. It's great that you have these controls on there that you can see that. But for me personally, seeing it always, seeing it go to black and white is not really what I want. Well, here's the cool thing. Those controls show up automatically while you're adjusting exposure and focus, if you're doing manual focus, as long as the tray is open. And that's the key. So let's go back into this. I'm going to open up the manual exposure controls again. There we go. 
and I'm going to adjust exposure. And as I'm adjusting it, you see our zebra striping is up there. So I'm overexposed there. You see all the red zebras. I go down to underexposed, and I see all the blue zebras. And obviously, the image is still in color. As soon as I take my thumb off the control, those fade away. Same thing with focus. If I go in with manual focus, my focus peaking turns on. Right, so there, that's in focus, out of focus, whatever. And I'm seeing the focus peaking. As soon as I take my thumb off of the control, those lines go away. If I hide the drawer, if I hide those analytics, so I'm going to tap the A in the bottom left to hide the drawer, now those controls are no longer there. I no longer have my peaking, my focus peaking, I no longer have the zebra striping. So as long as that drawer is open, you get those controls while you're manipulating it. You close the drawer, and they go away. Pretty cool. Good to know. So honestly, I'm going to say leave that drawer open all the time because that's kind of important information. You want to really know where your focus peaking is if you're doing manual focus. You want to know where you're uh, blowing out a highlight if you're manual, doing manual exposure. Just leave it open all the time, and the data is there. OK, the last of these three little icons, the, we'll start with the, the first one now in the bottom left corner, the three colors. If you tap this, you get control of your white balance, your gamma or exposure curve, and some really interesting controls over color. So we're going to, again, go through these quite quickly because we'll spend a lot more time on these later. Right now, I'm in auto white balance. You can see in the bottom right corner, it says uh, of that white box, you see it says w, uh, AWB for auto white balance. If I move the camera around, it's going to pick it and move it around a little bit. You can see, see the dot in the, uh, the color field there moving. That's showing me a different white balance. And if you look in the bottom left corner, very bottom left corner of the screen, it says 5093K temperature. That is your color temperature. That is the current color temp. And this information bit right here, by the way, is something you only get on the iPhone 10, or you only get on screens that are wider than 16 by 9. So in this case, you're seeing the color temperature down in the bottom left corner. I'll explain the upper right in a moment. And then the um, audio things on the right-hand side are bigger when you're on this type of a screen. But anyway, in the bottom left corner, you see your color temp. And as I move this around, you can see that number moving. OK, so that's cool. But what if I want to manually control it? Well, I can go in here and simply drag the dot around to control it on all axes simultaneously. Or I can adjust just the temperature by dragging that slider up and down, or just the tint by dragging that slider up and down. And you can see how that gets affected in the, um, the larger color display. If I want to lock it, let's say, so I'm going to tap on the AWB again to go auto. Right? I go, you know what, this is perfect. That's where I want it to be. See in the bottom right corner of the white box, there it says AWB, it's in blue. I'm going to tap that, and it goes red. I have now locked the color temperature. So just like with the focus and the exposure reticule, you can lock the color temperature, you can lock your focus, lock your exposure, and those things are not going to change. You then have presets, A and B presets, which you can set on your own, and we'll do that in another video. And then you can see you have kind of default presets, tungsten, cloudy day, and so on. So you have on there auto white balance. You have your standard, what, tungsten, daylight, cloudy day, fluorescent, I guess that would be. Um, and then you have two presets, an A and a B preset that you can custom define. So total, total white balance control in there. Then we go down to the next one, your gamma curve. So you've got a natural curve, a dynamic curve, a flat, and a log. Let me reset that. The top left corner, you see the little red, um, the red circle arrows. I'm going to tap on that. That resets that. Let me actually get out of here for a moment and refocus this scene. Let me just kind of kind of reset everything, go back to normal, if you will, here. Oh, there we go. There's my focus. Get the exposure out, focus out. There we go. Just kind of set things back. Um, auto white balance is back to auto. Let that adjust. There you go. That's ni nicely adjusted. OK, now I'm going to go into this curve and now watch. And, and I'm going to have to turn it off. Actually, I'll do it like this. I'm going to move this over so we see the grays a little bit more clearly. As I go through the different gamma curves, you'll see those grays and the response on the grays change quite a bit. So there's natural. There's dynamic. So dynamic is a higher contrast. You see our darks got darker, our brights got brighter. A flat curve all the way up to a log curve. So if you are shooting higher end video production, if you're shooting in log, you can do a log curve on here, which is pretty cool. That log curve, if you've never done it, is really all about doing having more control in color grading in post than you would if you shot in a non-log curve. So kind of awesome in there. You have a lot more controls underneath that, as you can see. You can adjust your shadow and highlight, or your, I'm sorry, your black and your white point, your clipping points on there. You can adjust your camera. You can adjust shadow and highlight detail or highlight responsiveness. And we'll go through all those in future sessions. I'm going to reset that. And then underneath that, again, you have the same type of thing with color. I can increase or decrease saturation, increase or decrease vibrance. And on the individual red, green, and blue channels, I can actually compress 
individual red, green, or blue channels on there to get a totally unique look. There's also built-in noise reduction. You see that in the, up in the top right corner on there. So um, it doesn't always, it kind of depends on the mode that you're in, but you turn that on and, um, and that'll allow you to do automatic noise reduction. Okay, so there's your color controls. So you, full white balance control, full exposure gamma curve control, um, highlight and shadow control, and individual RGB channel compression. It's a lot. You, you start to see just how much stuff is in here. Okay, moving on. There's a lot to do in an overview here. In the middle of the screen, bottom middle, you see your time code layout there, your time code reader that's showing you what's, what's shooting. So if I hit record on there, you'll see your timer counting down to what's on there. If I tap on that, either while I'm recording or not, doesn't matter. If I tap on that, it switches to show me a histogram. There is an RGB histogram and there is a waveform monitor. So if you're doing something where you want super accurate exposure, the ability to have that wave on there is super awesome. It also shows you to the left of that, and let's see here, you can, yeah, you can see that clearly enough. See, it says 30 FPS and then 4K. That's just telling me what mode that I'm in. I'm in 30 frame per second shooting mode and I'm in 4K. All of this can be changed. We're gonna get into that in a moment. To the right of that, you'll see a little battery indicator. So see the little green batteries, tell me I've got a full battery. And underneath that is your disk full indicator. Now this is a super, super important little indicator to be aware of. It's a little pie chart. It shows me on mine that I'm about, um, not quite three quarters full, let's, let's call that two thirds full. Super, super important to keep an eye on that thing. As your disk starts, your internal storage starts to get full, it's gonna go yellow, it's gonna go red, and it's gonna start flashing red. If this thing is ever flashing red at you, just stop shooting immediately. And here's why. The way that iOS works, as far as what it communicates back to the app, is if you are recording, so remember your store, you have your storage in here, right? You're it's like, this is a, a 256 gig device. So I got 256 gigs on here. But you don't actually have access to all of that for storage, right? The operating system has some, RAM uses some as a scratch disk. There's like a, a whole thing where it'll use some of the storage as not as fast RAM as RAM. And that available space kind of fluctuates. If you get yourself into a situation where you're recording, the thing's flashing red at you like you should have stopped by now and you're not stopping, and then finally you stop, iOS will then look at that and decide if it has enough space to store that file. If it doesn't, it's gonna throw the whole shot away. You lose everything. This has nothing to do with Filmic. This is how the operating system handles it. If it doesn't have space, what's it gonna do? Well, it can't do anything about it. It's just gonna dump the file. So keep an eye on the storage space. If you see that thing get into yellow, stop what you're doing, offload some footage. If it gets to red, really stop what you're doing. And if it's flashing red, dude, seriously, like it was time to stop a long time ago. So just keep these things in mind. Underneath that, you will see a tiny little white line. Now, I haven't seen this myself, but apparently on a device that is not ultra wide like this, that is also where you're gonna have your audio level meters. In my device, you see the audio level meters on the right hand side bouncing away, and you can see them reacting to me talking. And the, uh, the little white line underneath the time code is a audio gain. So I can take that way down to make the audio a little bit quieter, take it way up to make the audio a bit louder. That is only there because that's where the audio level meters used to be. It's kind of an odd position, but if you're looking at it on an iPhone 10 widescreen, then know that that is where that is. It's a little bit hidden. It's kind of a funky UI position, but, but there you go. Um, so that's what that is. So that is everything that we need to talk about on there. Moving on to the right again, you have the gear menu, which brings up the intense amount of settings that we have in here. This is a space where we will be spending a lot of time in future videos going through, but let me just give you a quick overview of some of these and also how it works, and you can spend some time exploring them on your own, but I'm gonna hit the top level ones right now. So first of all, to open any of these, obviously just tap on it. You'll notice when you open it, you don't have a back button or a close button. Just tap anywhere outside of that window and it returns you back to the previous menu. So here's some controls that you have. First of all, at the top, you have a aspect ratio, 16 by nine being native, but you can do a 17 nine, a three two, a one to one, two two. You have all these different aspect ratios for shooting your video at. You can choose to crop the source itself to the overlay or you can have it not cropped in the footage and just see the overlay itself. You have underneath that, you have two different um, options here. You have your frame size, so 4K, 2160p, that's 4K, that's 2000, it's double, it's ultra HD, 2160p, right? So that's your resolution. Um, and then you go down, you got 3K, 1836p, 2K, 1152, standard HD at 1080p, and low HD at 720p. So you might be thinking, I'm gonna park on this one, the 3K. You might be thinking, why would I have 3K? I, who shoots, three, what's 3K? That doesn't even exist, right? Well, what's the point of 3K? Here's why you, why you might wanna shoot 3K. One of the great advantages of shooting 
4K is that you have a lot of room to push into a shot, to reframe a shot, to crop a shot, to stabilize a shot, to do any number of things that would normally require you zooming into the footage, scaling that footage up. So let's say that your delivery is HD, 1920 by 1080. If you shoot HD and your delivery is HD, if you want to do anything to that shot, push in a little bit because you wish you were a bit closer, reframe it a bit, stabilize it, these all require making the shot bigger. You're scaling it up past 100%, not so good. When you're shooting 4K, you can go 200% zoomed in and not expand your pixels, not go past your one-to-one -one pixel point. But 4K is a lot. 4K is really big. And if you know you're doing 1080 and you just want a little bit of room to punch into, a little bit of room to stabilize or do other things in post, then shooting 3K is probably going to be enough and you're going to save storage space. So that's just one of those things. Um, and depending on the device you have, you may not be able to shoot 4K. So shooting 3K will allow you to get a little bit more than HD without going all the way up to 4K. Kind of cool. Underneath that, you have your compression levels. So this, these are basically your bit rates. You have your filmic extreme, which is the highest level. You go down to filmic quality, the kind of middle level. Apple standard, this is what you'd get if you're shooting uh, internally just with a regular camera. And then, uh, then you have economy, which is a much lower bit rate. So the actual bit rates here are not published bit rates because they're not constant. They're not constant because it's a smartphone. Smartphones don't do a constant bit rate. They do a variable bit rate. So if you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. For those of you who know what I'm talking about, a variable bit rate is usually kind of an annoyance. But when it comes off of the phone, that's just the way that it is. Your software, whether you're shooting Premiere or editing Premiere or Final Cut or Resolve, whatever, it's going to handle it, no problem. Don't worry about it. The interesting thing is, from what the filmic guys have told me, is that there are other apps out there that force a bitrate. Like they'll say, okay, it's 150 megabit, right? And that's, they say, that's it. And they will output a file that is consistent 150 megabit. But they're using filler data. They're basically adding data, adding, it's like, I don't know, like, like foam into the shot just to fill up the data space to make it look like it's a solid 100 megabit when you're not actually adding any value to that shot. You're not, not adding any extra real information. So the fact that it is variable, don't let that put you off. This is normal when shooting on a smartphone. It's just the way it is. If you want the highest quality, you go to Filmic Extreme and you get the highest quality. Now I'm going to bring your attention to the top left corner of the screen. And this is, again, one of these little info tabs that you only get on the bigger display. You notice at the top it says FE, and underneath that it says 244M. The FE is telling me what bit rate or what codec I'm shooting to. So not codec, but what uh, compression I'm shooting to. So this is Filmic Extreme. If I drop down to Filmic Quality, see it's now it says FQ in the top left. If I go to Apple Standard, it says AS. If I go to Economy, it says Eco for Economy. You may have noticed as I've dropped those down, the number underneath it went up. That is a reading in minutes of roughly estimated because A, it's variable bit rate, and B, your device is memory that's available storage. It fluctuates depending on the operating system and what it's doing, as we already explained. But this is an estimate of how much shooting time you have left on your device. So in the economy, I could shoot for about 1,015 minutes. We're in 3K right now. So let's, let's bring it up to 4K. Let's go 4K 2160. So in economy, I get about 487 minutes, which actually, that's a huge, that's a really interesting difference right there. So let me, oh, this is great, actually. I hadn't planned on this, but let's go back all the way down to HD. So 1080p, 1,015 minutes in economy. 2K, still 1,015 minutes. Oh, that's interesting. Um, 3K, still 1,015 minutes. Oh, very interesting. Huh. I can't explain that. Uh, but we go up to 4K, and look at how much it drops. So shooting full 4K, you are really taking up a lot more space. So that, that's kind of awesome. OK, so anyway, we're in 4K 2160p in economy, 487 minutes. Now let's bump it up to Apple Standard. I got 244 minutes. Filmic quality, 162. And Filmic Extreme, 122. So a massive, massive difference there in how much you can put on your internal storage, depending on the quality and the size of what you're shooting with. And I can't explain why the 2K and 3K and HD were all the same. It's a little bit odd. They did express to me, the filmic guys did express to me when we chatted, that there were some changes in iOS 12 that they may not have caught up with yet. Some things are being fed to them differently. So I would wager that that's one of those reasons. So you probably expect a fix for that in the not too, not too distant future. Anyway, OK, so that's a lot of time spent in this one field, but it's a really one uh, settings box, but it's a lot of important stuff to know. You kind of got to know all this stuff to do your basics. Getting out of that, you can get into frame rate. We will explore this at a future time. But this allows you to choose your frame rate. Are you shooting 30p? Are you shooting 60p? If you're shooting in HD, so I'm in 4K, so you notice 60p is the highest. If I drop down to, let's go down to standard HD and go back into the frame rate, I can go all the way up to 240p, 240 frames per second. You can, as you might be able to infer from those two bottom 
uh, dialogues, which is 240 capture and 240 playback, you can do variable frame rate, VFR shooting, meaning you can shoot more or fewer frames per second than is required, so you end up with a slow motion or a speed up effect. That's all something you can do in here. Again, we'll explore all that in a future video. All right, audio controls, what microphone is going to be used, and you'll see at the bottom down there you can access a Bluetooth microphone, you can choose to shoot video only, um, gain correction automated for your audio, and special voice processing. So again, all stuff that we'll explore later. One of the things I want to point out to you, you, right now, just looking at the screen, you would not know that there is more menus underneath it. It's a little bit of a UI glitch, and you're not seeing any clear indicator there's more under it. What that tells you is in any of these, just when you open it, just push up and see what else is hiding there. Like this, HEVC, the high efficiency video codec that was hiding underneath these sources here, these options here that you may have not realized. So whenever you're in one of these, when you're just kind of playing around with the app, learning it, just do that. Make sure you scroll up and see what else is in there. So audio, again, we had that different audio codecs um, and a lot of audio controls that we can choose from in there. You have specific device things, like do you want to save to the camera roll? Uh, you can archive target will allow you to save off to a Western Digital remote drive. You have a remote control capability. This is one, again, we're going to do a whole show just on this, but you have a remote control app that you can buy. It's a separate purchase that will allow you to control the camera, to control this camera from another device. Ooh, really neat. So that's going to be a super fun one to play with. Uh, let's see here, presets. This is really important one to know, so I want to highlight this. There's a lot of things you can change, right? Between your resolution, your frame rate, and all these other things. You could spend a lot of time building these the way you want it. Then you can save those settings as a preset. So if you're on a shoot and you, are, you design a setup for a particular type of shot and you know you're going to want to return to that, you can save that as a preset, name it whatever you want, and there you got it. So love that, love that. Um, content management in here, time code tracking. We're going to get into all this production scene take information getting embedded in. Hardware choices, or hardware options. There are There is support built in for a lot of different hardware add-ons, including things like anamorphic adapters, um, the DJI Osmo for doing uh, gimbal work. A lot of stuff in here that is really, really cool, so we're going to talk about that. You can save your settings to the cloud, to the Filmic Cloud, so you can load them on multiple devices. Community tab will take you to all their social media stuff. Um, this is really an important one here, the overview. The overview lets you see everything that is currently set on the device so that you can, at a glance, go, okay, just double check everything. Okay, I'm in 4K, I'm in 30, I'm in this, and you go, ooh, gosh, I'm in 25P instead of 30P. Ooh, just a nice, quick, top-down overview of all the settings. Super, super helpful to have. Um, again, for those watching live, remember, if you've got any questions that come up, pop them into the chat. Make sure you put at photo just in front of it, and I will address your question um, as they come up. All right, so there's all of that. Um, that was overview. Stabilization, you can just turn on and off the built-in stabilization. Which camera are you going to use? So in this case, I'm on the iPhone 10 with dual lenses, so you've got the wide lens. I can switch to the telephoto lens, which doesn't focus that closely, but the telephoto, um, a zoom lens, and then you can flip it around and use the, uh, the selfie camera if you want to. Hi. So you can do that as well. So you can choose which, which lens you want on your device. Um, the torch, that's your light, so the actual LED light on the camera, you can set that on or off in low, medium, or high. You have a guide grid, you can see that on the screen itself, the little grid popping up, and then information just tells you all the basic info about the device. Oops, let's not do that. Takes you to their website, perfect. Uh, to the right of the gear button, so that's everything in the gear. To the right of the gear button, you have the play button, which is going to bring up your recording, your list of all your recorded shots. When you open one of these, not only can you play it, but you can do some basic editing in here as well. You can do some trimming in here. You can do some color adjustments. There's a lot of different stuff that you can do in here, so we will spend some time exploring that as well. However, I would argue that most people aren't going to do that. Most people who are using this app are probably not going to do their color and trimming and so on in here. They're probably going to be doing that in post in another app, whether you're using it and doing it in something like uh, LumaFusion on your iPad or you're doing it in Final Cut or Premiere on the desktop. Odds are you're not going to need this, but we'll look at it. We'll, we'll spend some time there when the time comes. Uh, from here, you can share your clips. Um, you know, you can save them off to different locations, save them off to the camera roll. You can share them and so on. Um, important thing, actually, before I leave this while I'm, so I don't forget, is there are some settings, not many, but there are some settings, particularly when it gets into anamorphic, where you are creating more data in the app, a bigger file, let's put it this way, you can create a bigger file size in the app than the camera roll will support. So if you were to save the footage from the 
uh, from Filmic Pro to the camera roll, you wouldn't actually be getting the full resolution. When you're in Filmic, you are saving, you can by default, you are saving the shots that you shoot inside of its own container, its own space. They're not going to be in your camera roll unless you explicitly tell it to do that. So if you're shooting in one of these modes that's giving you a bigger file, again, like anamorphic, you're not going to want to save them to your camera roll and then save them off to another device. You're going to want to connect the camera and via iTunes access the content directly. Also, I believe, and I have to verify this, but I believe you can access the content inside of the Filmic container through the Apple Files system, so other apps should be able to access it directly. That stuff I'm going to have to experiment and play with and see exactly how it works, but in theory, that should work. Okay. Uh, let's just get out of the play area. Um, and to the right of play is the big white button that obviously starts recording. Starts recording. So that, I think that's everything. Oh, well, on the right, you have your audio level meters. Um, the, I'm using a mono microphone, just the built-in mic, so you can see it's all the same levels. Uh, at the top, we see the uh, the peaking numbers on there. And it also tells me at the very bottom of that which camera it's using, uh, which microphone it's using, in this case, the back internal microphone. So that, my friends, is that. That is the overview. It's a lot of information. It is a complex app. I see in here Paul Feeney saying, love this. Um, where do we go? Here we go. Uh, oh no, it was Julie. It says, uh, the app is so powerful, but a pretty steep learning curve that it is. This is invaluable. Thank you. You're quite welcome, Julian. I hope you'll stick around to watch the rest of the training because we are going to go deep into all of these things. Paul says, love this app for time lapse with the Moondog Labs anamorphic adapter. Cool. Automatic de squeeze within the app and vlog. You can use the vlog in LumaFusion. Look at that. There you go. Super advanced use of it. Yeah, it has, we didn't talk about it, but in the frame rate choices, you can do time lapse. Uh, so you have up to one minute interval time lapse controls in here, and then you'll output the video in whatever resolution you want it to be. So that's really neat. You see, that's how one of the ways Paul's using it with the anamorphic adapter. Super cool. I don't have an anamorphic lens yet. I got to get one. So Moondog, oh, and incidentally, so it says on here, let's go into these settings real quick again. If I go into the, where was it? The hardware setting. See, it says Moondog anamorphic. 2.4 to 1 adapter. If I turn that on, you can see how it squeezed the footage on there. So that is designed for the Moondog anamorphic. However, the Moment anamorphic lens is the exact same de-squeeze ratio, 2.4 to 1. So if you have the uh, Moment anamorphic lens, you can use that on here and turn that on. It's the same thing. So you got the Moondog and the anamorphic. I don't know if there's any others out there. Those are the two that I'm aware of. Um, I got to get my hands on one of those. I think I, the moment stuff looks really cool to me. Got to play with that. But I, I'll play with the moon dog as well. Um, all right, let's see here. Another question. Mike Swain says, would you tell us what the items are when you touch the timer audio gain bar? The, yeah, OK, so let me make sure I understand. You're, you're talking about this center bar, right? So you've got your time code. This one I'm shooting is showing me my elapsed time from shooting. So that's hours, minutes, and seconds. If I tap on that, it brings up a waveform. So this is a luminance wave, and the next one is an RGB wave. The fact that those are different levels, let me cycle through back through them again. The fact that this one looks like a different amount of data than this one is another one of those IS12 potential, iOS 12 possible changes that Filmic has to kind of get into, because those should look the same. But the height of that data peak is not what's important. It's where those peaks are. That's what really matters. So you knowing that you are looking at uh, data that is either blown out or not. So you can see on here, the, let me bring up the manual exposure. As I adjust it, you can see how I'm pushing the data all towards the shadows. I have no highlight clipping there. I don't even have any data in the highlights. I get to about there. We're looking at the right-hand side. We see my highlights are protected. As I start to go up, you see that peak that just climbed up the right-hand side. That's showing me that I'm clipping some data. And if I pull that all the way up, there's all my shadow detail in there. So uh, this is a basic uh, histogram on there, and either RGB or luminance. And uh, you are getting the, the value information, the, uh, the exposure value information on there. The last one is a waveform monitor. This is a very, I'll call it an advanced way of monitoring your exposure levels. It is ideally designed to use with something like this. So. Um, if I point this at here, if I point this at here, let me get rid of the white thing. You can see the waveform on there. You can see the lines on there. Let me get my reflection out of the black. Um, you can see the lines on there. It's showing me where the exposure levels are. And so I know what's white, what's black, and what's middle for where the exposure is. And I can adjust my exposure to get that exactly as I want it. It's really all about getting very, very accurate exposure. Um, we'll probably spend a little bit more time in there, but it, because it's so small, it's a little hard to really use. I personally would like to see it much bigger, become much more useful for doing accurate exposure monitoring. But it is there. The fact that it's there is pretty darn cool. Um, 
Okay, let's see here. Uh, music machine player. Remember, guys, put if you put at photo Joseph in front of the question, that makes it easier for me to make sure that um, I address it. Uh, and Mike Swaim, if I didn't get all your questions answered, if there's something else you're asking about, just let me know. Music machine player says, is there a reason my shutter speed keeps changing when I move the exposure level via the red circle? Huge issue for me. Okay. Let's, yeah, I kind of glossed over this because it's something I want to focus on later, but let's let's just talk about it a little bit. So let me kind of reset a couple things here. Take that, that, and that. Okay. So exposure on the left-hand side. Remember, I move this dial and my exposure goes up and down. See the numbers that are changing right there? You've got one that says 105 right now. I'll bring it down. It's 86, 85, 83, and so on and so on. Underneath that, it says 1 60th, and that is 1 60th of a second. If I raise this up, keep on going up, keep on going up. At some point, the exposure shutter speed is going to change. Let's go the other way. Uh, there we go. Sh exposure shutter speed is going to change. 120th, 240th of a second, 480th of a second, and so on. So those two numbers, the bottom number is your, your shutter speed. 60th of a second, 120th of a second, and so on. The top one is your ISO. That top number is the ISO that is being used. Remember, on a normal camera, you have three things that go into your exposure. You have your ISO, you have your shutter speed, and you have your aperture. These cameras don't have a mechanical aperture. There is no aperture. So you're reduced to two different ways to adjust your exposure, ISO and shutter speed. If you want to lock in your shutter speed, which is what we're basically doing here, we're trying to keep a 1 60th of a shutter speed as much as possible. You can override all this. You can take control if you want to. But we're trying to keep a 1 60th of the shutter speed as much as possible. It is going to ramp the ISO up and down. If you wanted to shoot and lock in your shutter speed and lock in your ISO, there is no aperture, so you can't lock that in. Then what you really need to do is do what professional videographers do with a professional camera, is adjust your exposure using a neutral density filter, a variable neutral density filter. That's something else that I will look at in a future video as well. Uh, when I'm shooting on my Lumix cameras, I lock my exposure manually, and then all the adjustments are done with the uh, variable ND filter. That is, to me, the best way to adjust the exposure. So that's what we're doing here. That way, you're not changing your your uh, shutter speed, which will change the look of a shot, especially anything moving, uh, changing the ISO, which will change the look of the shot as noise goes in and out of the frame, in and out of the shot, or change your depth of field, which will happen if you're changing exposure, uh, sorry, changing aperture. So I try to lock all those things in, and that's what you're seeing in here. So back to your question, is a reason the shutter speed keeps changing when you move the exposure level, the, ex the shutter speed has to change to at some point. At some point, you get to where it has to change because the, uh, there's not enough ISO one way or the other to compensate for whatever scene that you pointed at. Now, one thing you may have run into is notice, OK, we're looking on the left-hand side again. It says 496 right now and 160th. There's three dots in the middle. If I swipe across that, this gives me three different shooting modes. Look at the very top of the frame. It says, uh, let me go back, come here. There we go. Uh, first one is low ISO bias. Sorry, it's kind of hard to get that up there, get the timing right. Moderate ISO bias, and then to the right, it says high ISO bias. So that is telling, that is me telling the system to keep the ISO as low as possible, keep the ISO in the medium range, or go ahead and go for a high ISO. So that's maybe you've switched that without realizing it, and that's where you're running into your shutter speed problem. But um, but in general, you only have two things that can change, your ISO and your shutter speed. So if your shutter speed's changing, it has to. You've probably hit the limit of what, where the ISO can go. Hopefully that answers the question now. OK. Uh, Stephen Gibbons, will using Filmic Pro with stabilization turned off help with the jello you get when using an iPhone with the Osmo Mobile? No, jello effect is, has nothing to do with stabilization. A jello effect is because of the way that data is written to the sensor. It's written in lines. And this is, this is something that affects essentially all digital cameras. The only way that you will have a sensor, a digital sensor that is not, does not have a jello effect at all, is something called a global shutter. That is something that I, I don't think is in any consumer level camera right now. It's kind of, I don't want to say it's future tech, it's really high end tech that will eventually make its way down. Once we have global shutter, all pixels are exposed simultaneously instead of being written as a scan line, uh, like a scan line. This obviously happens very, very fast, but it's written sequentially. And that's why you get the jello effect. Because imagine, if you will, something moving very quickly, just a very quick move from left to right or whatever, it doesn't matter the direction, moving. When you're here, you're writing up to here. But by the time you get down to this point, the frame has moved. And so what is being written is moving. Does that make sense? And so you end up with this jello effect of your footage. Some cameras are very, very good at controlling that jello effect. Um, 
again, not to tout the Lumix cameras, but the Lumix cameras are fantastic at, at reducing that. You see very little jello effect in there. Uh, sadly, I've seen some really bad jello effect on Sony cameras. On the iPhone, it's pretty darn good, actually. I'd be curious to know what kind of uh, device you're using. Oh, you said iPhone. So um, with the mobile, with the Osmo Mobile, I guess maybe just because of the amount of moving that it's getting, it's getting a little bit more of that jello. Uh, but no, the stabilization isn't really likely going to help that. However, I would turn stabilization off either way, regardless of the jello effect. I would turn it off when using a gimbal because then you've got competing stabilization um, schemas going on, schema, scheme, whatever. You have competing stabilization happening. So uh, one or the other. Just turn off the in-camera one when you're on the mobile, uh, on the Osmo. OK, Mike Swain says, if you touch the 1 60th and it turns red, is it locked? Yes, absolutely. So that's something we're going to get into in future courses as well. Anything that you touch and turns red, red means that it's locked. So that was your exposure reticle, your focus reticle, the, uh, the white balance position, the, oh, the exposure, the shutter speed, or the ISO. Yes, when you tap it and it's red, it is now locked. So very, very good to know. OK, whew, man, that turned into a lot of stuff. Uh, that is the last question there. OK, so we're going we're gonna to wrap this up. So remember, this is an overview. There is so much more to learn in here. So I hope that you will join me on this journey. Um, you can obviously tune in live whenever we do these classes. Next week's, I don't even know if I'm doing one next week, because I'm going to be out of town Tuesday to Thursday. So either I'm doing one on Monday or I'm not doing one next week. I haven't figured that out yet. But um, every time that we do this, normally Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific time, they are free to watch live. Even if you manage to watch all of them live and you're really enjoying it and you really feel like you're learning something, the best way to support what we do here is to go to photojoseph.com slash members and sign up as a paid member. Then you have access to all the training at any time that you want, which is kind of awesome. So I would certainly appreciate that. And of course, if you miss any of those sessions, that's how you get to it. You can also buy individual videos if you just want to see one, but um, the pricing is designed so that it's uh, it's just better for pretty much everybody to watch uh, to do to membership. So that is that, my friends. Thank you very much for tuning in today. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoy the rest of what we've got to offer here. And uh, if you're new to the channel entirely, you know what to do. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. We do a live show three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific called Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, doing all kinds of fun live chit chat about photography and video and live streaming and all that kind of stuff. And if you're a regular, well, thanks for tuning in as always. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.